Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas Podcast, the 98-2, where uh, attitude is everything. The 98-2 rule is 98% attitude and 2% aptitude. And I am like a kid in a candy store today because since I was six years old, guys, I've been a Houston Oilers fan, uh, now a Tennessee Titans fan, been a diehard and have never had any friends to be able to share this with. But I have a friend now to be able to share it with, two of them actually, uh, coming to you from Tennessee. And this is Jamie and John Robinson. Uh, welcome to the podcast, guys. Thank you Thanks, for having us. So I wanted to uh, jump right in, John. Uh, first of all, how did you guys meet? Uh, was it, Did you have game or did she have the game? Um, I think it was probably more me. I was met with a little resistance, um, but my, my, my never say, my never take no for an answer um, kind of attitude and, and, and makeup, I was persistent. Um, but we, we joke all the time. Um, you know, I, I tell her, uh, you saw your meal ticket coming from a mile away which at the time I was making a whopping $8,000 a year as a restricted earnings coach. So um, I don't know that I was that big of a catch. So, so do you liken this to your, uh, you know, as a, as a kid, I, I've, I've done, uh, it's been great to be able to uh, learn about you. So I know that you were on a baseball team early. You guys were horrible. Um, then you guys, then you guys started working it out and then you started smashing teams. Do you liken that to your relationship with Jamie where you, you know, uh, first of all, you were horrible and now she kind of caught on and you're, you're in the championship. Yeah, it's that, that's probably, that's taken what, 16, 17, 18 years. Uh, I lose track. <laughs> I like um, how the year is just, you know, broad, tries broad, to get there. broad, broad variance. It's probably <laughs> close to 20 that, that we've, it may actually be 20, it's, 21. It'll be 21 in July that we actually 21 met. 21 in July that we've actually met. So. 18 married. Wow. wow that's awesome. Graduate. Yeah. I was a baby. I was 19. Wow. Go, go John. That, <laughs> you were going, you were going from young, man. There we go. Jamie, what is your version of the story? Because my wife's version of us meeting and getting together is completely different than mine. So what is yours? It was pretty much what he said. I, I honestly, I was nervous around him. He was a pretty boy. So auto automatically I'm like, he's going to have this pretty boy attitude. I don't want anything to do with him. I am done with pretty boys. And, um, he was very persistent and finally I was like, okay, I'll go on a date with you. And uh, it, that was it. One date. And we were together ever since. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Now, where'd you guys meet at? Did you guys meet in Missouri? Or did you meet where at? No, in, in, in Louisiana. So she was, she was working at, uh, at Bubba two's Bubba's two. It was kind of a sports bar, a uh, restaurant where, mm -hmm. uh, the coaches hung out. That was kind of our getaway. Um, to just kind of you know relax and chill and and she was working in there and she was kind of the cute blonde walking around and i was like hey how you doing and um i spent a lot of money at bubba too just uh let's, let's just say that <laughs> so john we john we grew up at the uh at the same time we're the exact same age i'm 44 you're 44. um so who was your team who was your football team growing up the it was the cowboys back when i grew up it was the cowboys or the <laughs> It was Cowboys or Steelers because I grew up in the country and, and you could only get three channels or actually two channels. I got CBS and NBC and, and you were going to get one of those two teams on, on the, on those channels. So um, I picked the Cowboys and, and I grew up uh, rooting for Tom Landry and Randy White and all those guys um, coming up through the, uh, through the ranks. It's funny because this morning I was looking at an old picture because today is siblings day. And his sister had posted a old picture of he was in a Cowboys shirt and she was actually in a Steeler shirt. And I didn't put two and two together until he just said that. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Well, she, she faked like she was a, a football fan when we first got together. I think they do this, am I correct, John? Where they, uh, the, the ladies, they'll fake like they like something and then they hook us. And then afterwards, <clears throat> she used to watch the UFC with me and watch football with me. And then uh, we got married and she's like, I don't have three hours to sit around and do nothing. And I was like, look, my friend John is not doing nothing. He's changing the world by helping the Tennessee Titans to win the Super Bowl in 2020. Am I correct, John? That's, that's uh, I spend a lot of hours trying to trying to do that. So yes, I'm not doing nothing. And, I, and my, my world re revolves around football. <laughs> and by the, for the record, I do like football. When I for, met him, I was a, Brett Favre fan, so 
I followed Brett Favre, and when he retired, my heart has been broken, and I have yet fallen in love with another quarterback as great as him, so I just am not as invested into the game on Sundays anymore. But I'm up for recruit, so. I have, I have given, John, I have given her choices. I've given her choices of Marcus Mariota. I've given her choices of Tannehill. Um, I've given her choices of uh, Marcus Tannehill or Ryan Mariota uh, that they can match together. Um, so I've given her choices in, in different ways. Um, so I see it, John, uh, you, you picked up a different career too. Um, you started in the hairdressing industry and you started off with your first client as your daughter. Talk to us about that experience. Actually, my first client was myself. I saved a lot of money uh, in college and, and those, you know, those real lucrative early coaching jobs uh, that I spoke about earlier. Um, I cut my own hair and um, I just kind of figured it, it didn't look perfect, um, but it has come in quite handy over, over the years. Um, it's usually just with the clippers, um, but, but I have decided to venture out into um, what somewhat are now charted waters um, with uh, female uh, hair. I uh, cut my, uh, with the quarantine, um, our youngest Bailey, who's 11, uh, her hair was teetering on um, uh, <laughs> Crystal Gale length. Um, if for those country music fans that remember Crystal Gale. Um, and I decided I needed to kind of trim it down. Um, so I ordered a pair of uh, scissors off of uh, Amazon and uh, we, we commenced to, uh, to, to trimming her down last week. And <laughs> it actually looks pretty good. It's not bad. <laughs> so, uh, Jamie, why, why did you agree to a date with him? Talk to us about the three things that uh, you looked at and said, this is John. Obviously, it's his good looks. That's the number one. His hair, was on, his hair was on point because he was doing it. What were those three things or three or four things that you said, like, I'll let this guy hang out with me? Yeah, it was, he was definitely a gentleman. And he, like I said, I expected him to be, have that, I don't want to keep saying pretty boy attitude, but I don't really know how else to explain it. Like, he wasn't into himself. He wasn't into um, trying to impress me. He, you know, he was just, he was himself. And we just talked. I mean, we talked for a long time. And, um, there was just something different. It, it's weird because you can't put your finger on it when it happens. I called my mom the next day and I was like, oh man, I think I'm in for it, mom. I think I may have found him. She's like, Jamie, whatever, whatever. Because again, I'm 19 years old and, um, and it, it did. It just, I've never been treated the way that he ha treated me. And that was, you know, it was special, very special. So, John, what is the secret? You said you guys have been married 18 years, been together 20. What's the secret to be able to stay married for 18 years? We've been married for 12 years. Uh, this year is 12 years. And so what's, your, what's the secret? Because she told me when we got married that I didn't have any other choice, uh, that we were in for the rest of our lives. So help me with this. Well, Seth, <clears throat> being, the, being the man of the house, you know, I feel like I, I'm the one that should make all of the decisions. So it's, 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 it's my decision to let her tell me what to do. So, <laughs> but no, there's, um, seriously, there, I mean, there's just a lot of transparency. We have fun together. We try to go on, I mean, football season and, and football, my job takes up a lot of time. Um, but when I come home, I, I try to leave that stuff at the office. Um, you know, with cell phones, I mean, that can always be found by a text, by email, by a phone call. But um, I try to immerse myself uh, with my family, uh, with, with Jamie. We try to um, squeeze date nights in once a month, once every two months. Um, if it's nothing more than just getting out on, on our back porch and lighting a fire and sitting by and, and just kind of watching the sun go down and just being in each other's mm -hmm. company, um, we talk constantly. Um, there's great dialogue back and forth, and there's just an a general, uh, overall respect uh, for her, and I know there's a respect uh, on her end for me. Mm -hmm. And he understands how hard-headed I am. <laughs> <laughs> just let her win. Just let her win. It works. <laughs> I understand, man. My mom told me very early on that the sign of a strong woman was allowing, uh, allowing people to do what they were great at, even though she could do it better. Ooh. And... <laughs> Right. And my mom taught me this so huge because she would do this with my dad. Like she could do everything in the house, everything. She could go to work. She could 
clean. She could do everything. And she allowed my dad to feel like he was the man. And that's why I love having great women in our lives because we feel like the man, even though they could do all the stuff we do. <laughs> well, and what's, what's amazing is like, she, she's a, <clears throat> she, she takes care of the kids. She's a stay at home mom. But, and I tell her all the time, there's, there's not enough money in the world where I would want to trade my job f for your job because she's constantly on the go. She takes care of our girls. Um, she keeps them involved in activities, whether it's dance or sports. And, um, you know, she, she does a lot of stuff in the, in the community and, and for foundations that are important to us. And um, it, it's more than, you know, the whole, the whole stay at home mom. There's not a lot of staying at home with this one. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to jump right into current events because, I mean, obviously the world is going through some crazy stuff, uh, you know, COVID-19, all the stuff like that. But um, you said that when you guys got together, you were making $8,000 a year. You guys have been through trials, tribulations. People have the tendency to see you as John Robinson, the general manager of the greatest uh, organization to ever be in the uh, uh, NFL ever, okay? Um, Hall of Fame, everything like that, like 100%. But... Um, people see that and they're like, oh, well, it must be easy for John and Jamie because they're in this pinnacle. Talk to us about the fact of that $8,000, you got the $8,000 a year, you guys get married. What, what are some of the things that got you through those tough times? It you was, start. it was, um, it's some people don't understand, I would say, because where we did start, um, I would say I don't I don't know how to put it to where um I get a lot of negativeness about things and it's um well Jamie does this, Jamie does that and I'm like no no no, you don't understand. You know, it's part of the job as well as yes, it's fun, but it's a responsibility that he has as being the GM, you know, and um but starting out, I think that's why we're so humble and we're down to earth because we started out way down at the bottom and had with him working his way up. It's just been such an amazing blessing and we don't take anything for granted whatsoever. Yeah, the, um, you know, the, 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 those early years, there was a lot of uh, um, Lipton noodles and um, rice with with star kiss tuna mixed in there and uh, i can remember when i got promoted from restricted earnings to uh linebackers coach i was going to coach the linebackers and i got this enormous pay raise i went from eight thousand dollars to twenty five thousand dollars a year and we went to walmart and i bought the biggest 37 inch tube <laughs> screen tv it weighed 800 pounds it took me and four of my players to load it into my apartment um, but we were happy. We knew we had mm -hmm. each other. Um, I was doing what I love to do. Um, there was, there was certainly a relationship, but I think more importantly, there was a friendship between us. Mm -hmm. Um, she was invested in what we were going to do. And I kind of laid it out to her when we first started dating. Um, I said, listen, I like you and I think you, you, you like me and I want to continue this relationship, but, but I'm going to chase this football thing. I'm 22, 23 years old. I don't know where this is going to take me, but I can tell you, I'm not going to be in Thibodeau, Louisiana for the rest of my life. Like, I don't know if I'm going to go coach at LSU or Tennessee or Wyoming or wherever, but if you want to continue this relationship, I'm all in. If, but I want you to be on the same page that if time comes and this thing advances and, and I have to leave, um, that, that, that we're in this thing together. And she goes, let's ride. So, um, mm -hmm. we continued the relationship and it, it's been a lot of humble beginnings. You know, when mm -hmm. I, when I finally got into the league with the Patriots as a scout, um, she was kind of like a, a, a she was a widow at basically, cause I, I would leave in August and I would be gone until, de till December. So I would come home a weekend or two occasionally, but I was on the road scouting, trying to find players. Mm -hmm. And, and she was at home by herself with her dog and, there's a lot of stuff that we had to kind of go through a lot of tough times. Um, but we were extremely blessed to be, yeah. um, where we were and, um, we never took that for granted. I remember one time when we, um, <coughs> we had just gotten married. 
I had just, I was working at um, a health clinic at the time and I got my paycheck, went straight to the grocery store, checked out, called them crying. I just spent all my paycheck on groceries. <laughs> I'm like, what do we do? And he's like, it's okay, JB. It's okay. We'll figure it out. And I mean, that's just, that's what we, we had to do. Well, when when you go through those things, as far as like the, the breakthroughs, uh, Brooklyn and I had this early on in our marriage. Um, it's probably maybe a year and a half in. And we looked at, um, you know, we looked at our bank accounts. And I remember li- logging on to the first time because I had accountants that were dealing with it. But I logged on myself personally, which most people should never do. Or maybe you should do all the time. It's either or. Um, but I did. And John and Jamie, every single one of my bank accounts was zeroed out. Every one of my credit lines, my credit cards were all maxed out. Everything was done. I had zero money, but I was working harder than I ever had. And I remember I was almost in tears on the, um, in the living room saying like, I'm working my butt off, but I've got nothing. And I remember Brooke at that time, she just grabbed a hold of me. She gave me a hug, rubbed my back and said, everything's going to be okay. We'll get through this. And, um, you know, it like things started to move, but from the outside, again, people see and they're like, like a, a girl the other day said um, in the salon, uh, Brooklyn just got a chance to do uh, hair for the Golden Globes. And one of the girls, she's 20 years old in our company said, um, how did you get to do go- uh, hair for the Golden Globes? And my wife said, well, I've known the, uh, I've been an educator for Paul Mitchell for 17 years. I have great relationships and this is this has happened, this <clears throat> happened. And the girl said, yeah, yeah, whatever. I didn't ask that, but how did you get to do hair at the Golden Globes? And she said, well, it was the 17 years. It was this, that, the other. When did it really start to catch or when, when was that moment that you started to say, okay, this thing is starting to roll now? Was it the $25,000 a year or was it, did, you know, was it, was it on down the line? Yeah. I mean, I'd say it was probably a little bit further down the line. Um, you know, once, once I, my first couple of years with the Patriots, we, we moved from Louisiana uh, to Atlanta, and I did the southeastern region uh, for the for the Patriots. Uh, we did that for four years, and then there were a couple times. I mean, it was it was different for me because um, 19 days away from from her, and you know, you're living out of a suitcase, and and you're eating Dairy Queen and Wendy's and whatever you can get to get to the next school, and um, to scout players, and you got reports to type up at midnight. I mean, it just became pretty taxing. And I almost got out a couple of times and got went back to coaching. I was like, well, let's, let's kind of live a simpler life. Let's, um, you know, let's let's just go coach high school football. And I'm home every night at six o'clock. And you know, we'll get the white picket fence and that whole thing. Um, but God just kept telling me, no, you, you're not going to quit on this thing. And I just kept listening to that message. Um, and obviously, we talked about it. And then I, we got promoted to to national scout. We moved to Dallas. Um, I did that for two years, and then uh, my boss, um, Thomas Dimitrov, who was the college director at the time, he got the GM job for the Atlanta Falcons, which opened up a spot for me, uh, and then Coach Belichick promoted me to his job, and then once I was in that job and I was kind of overseeing the draft for the, um, for the Patriots, getting everything ready for, for Coach Belichick, and we were continuing to win, I'd seen Thomas move on. And, and be a GM. I started, the wheels started to go in motion. Like, you know, maybe God's got a plan for me here at some point. Um, he needed one, I needed one more stop along the way before I got to where I'm at down in Tampa with uh, my old buddy, Jason Light. Um, but w- I think once I got to, once we moved to Foxborough mm-hmm. and I was in the building every day and I was working hand in hand with coach Belichick and I was learning so much about football and team building. Uh, and I, and I saw, uh, friends of mine in the business start to get opportunities to run football teams. Um, I then began to think that maybe God had a plan for me one day. So Jamie, you going through this because everyone sees like, you know, obviously ESPN will uh, grab a hold of John and be like, you know, John, what are you, where's your vision for the Titans? And, you know, obviously he's saying Super Bowl and we're going to smash it and have seven championships in a row and just be the most dominant in all of history. But Talk to us about, from a wife standpoint, you know, what, what you're going through because you have children, um, your husband's away. Um, you know, he's obviously going after his passion. He's doing his thing. You're supporting him. You're being amazing. You guys love each other. What are some of the things that you went through during those times? So when we moved from Thibodeau to Atlanta, I thought I was excited because I had always that was my hometown, never left. I went to college there, you know, so I was like, why not, you know? 
And um, so when we moved to Atlanta, honestly, I felt like I was seeing him a little bit more right at the beginning because when he was coaching, um, actually, it was right when you got married, we got married was when he got the job with the Patriots. And my family's very old school, same as his. So there was no living together before being married. And I still lived with my parents, which we lived 45 minutes south of Thibodeau, if you can imagine that. So, and he was working all hours of the night. So I would leave for my job and just go home. Um, and there were times I remember it would be like a month straight and I wouldn't see him because he was working during the week and then there would be away games. And so there was no way to see him. So when we moved to Atlanta, even though he would leave for a couple of weeks at a time, week at a time, when he was home, he was home. And so I, I just found I was taking the positives out of everything and just trying to um, look at it that way. And then when we had our Taylor, our 14 year old now um, in Atlanta, and we moved to Texas, my sister lived in Texas. So we lived 20 minutes away from her and I had never lived by family before. And during that move, we took, um, we took a leap of faith and we, that's when we decided I was going to be a stay at home mom. So we took my salary, even though it was a small salary, but we took it out of the equation. And, you know, so those, those were actually tough years for us financially trying to live on that one salary. I remember one day he came home and he had a big F-150 truck. Next thing I know, he gets this little bitty truck and you see this big old burly guy in this little bitty truck doing these road trips. I'm like, what are you thinking? Trying to save money. It's okay. I just paid it off. It's fine. I can do this. So it's little things like that. But, um, I don't know. I looked at all the moves as a positive. I loved meeting new people. I loved seeing new sites that being in South Louisiana, I was not seeing. And um, there was no other way that I felt like, you know, I couldn't look at things negatively, you know. So John, how, like, uh, and I know uh, the stories of you growing up on the farm, you know, uh, like hard work, you know, working so, uh, so, uh, so much, so hard, things like that. That seems to be what you're looking for in players, um, but also what it seems like you're looking for in players is character. Because, I mean, obviously, I'm a, I'm a, rabid, a rabid fan. And before this has ended, I need to be announced as the greatest uh, Tennessee Titan uh, fan of all time. Can you get him a pin? Can you get him a pin? But... I mean, what's been so great is was we really, as, a, as an organization, we, because we're together, um, we haven't ever had, we, we, you're not building a, a, a diva-like kind of scenario. You're like from the outside, even from a, a, a layman perspective, it's a side where it's hardworking, everybody's together. How, how are you translating your, I mean, because that's basically your upbringing. How are you translating that into the culture of what you're doing there? Well, I mean, we, we say it all the time. I've been interviewing prospects for the last uh, three or four or five days here via, via FaceTime and, and, and Zoom meetings. And, and I've said it since I got here in, in 2016 when I told our fans that I was going to roll my sleeves up and go to work for them. We were going to build a winner here. Um, and and when, when we get these players in here, um, I tell them all the time, I don't, I don't care where you came from. I don't care how many stars you had beside your name in high school. Um, we as an organization, we believe in people more than players. We believe in people more than players. Because if you've got some sand to you, if you've got some grit to you, if you've been through tough times, if you know what it means to work hard and, and earn something, like we're not going to give you anything. And just because you may be a draft pick or somebody might else might have, somebody might have drafted you uh, before I got here, or even if I drafted you, if you don't earn it every single day, you won't work here and I'll find somebody else to take your place. And I think if you have, you have to have that standard in place for every single player so that everybody in the locker room from me all the way down knows what the expectation level is. That way we can hold each other accountable that they're going to do their job. And when they're not doing their job, I can call them out or their teammate can call them out. If I'm not doing my job, then the head coach can call me out or Miss Amy can call me out. That's, that's what it is. That's what a family is. Um, it's transparent conversations 
it's honest and open, but it's peeling back the layers of these players um, through this interview process to know if they're going to have the wherewithal and the makeup of the type of team that we're going to be. Because if you go back and look at the, at the playoff run, um, we beat the Patriots, we beat, we beat the Ravens, um, and those teams are really, really talented. They are really, really talented. Um, but the finish and the effort that our guys played with for four quarters, I think that embodied what we are as people um, and as Titans. Well, I, I want to thank you because my one of my really good friends is a Ravens fan, and she went, her name is Jen Horder, and if you're listening, Jen Horder, you got beat by the Titans, smashed. Um, but I was on a plane, and when I was on the plane, the Wi-Fi went out on the plane, so I could not watch the game. And it was the worst flight of my entire life. And I landed, and tell you, John, I had a great, I had a, a very important job. I was there for some people, things like that. But I landed, and I stayed, and the person kept circling to pick me up, and I would not go because the TV was on. And they kept calling, and I kept just hanging up on them and not getting my bag because I was watching the Titans smash the Ravens. I was, oh, I loved it. I loved it. Um, so now, obviously, you have that discipline. You have that culture. How does that work out for you with your 11-year-old daughter, John? Um, yeah, so that's probably a little, I'm a little less stern. Um, you know, I always said when we had kids that I was going to be the disciplinarian. Like, I was going to breathe a hammer and... <laughs> I am the complete opposite. I'm the biggest softy. Like if they want ice cream at 10 o'clock, like I'll put up a little bit of resistance AM, not PM. Um, at the end, I end up giving in. It's a good thing she's here because she actually is the hammer when it comes to, to the <laughs> discipline with the kids. I remember he would come home from um, being on the road when we were in Boston and um, they were so young at the time. And he would come home and just destroy everything that I had been doing that week. Or like, what are you doing? Oh, Jamie, it's going to be, be right. fine. It'll be fine. I'm like, no, but you have to go to work. I get to, to clean this mess up. No. So he finally, he finally figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> so my, we were playing Monopoly the other night. And um and I got boardwalk in Park Place and I put hotel, or, uh, houses on both. Well, my daughter landed on Park Place and I think the rent was like $700, $800. And I didn't say anything. She landed and I just said, bang, bang, uh, <laughs> pay me my money. And she looked at me and she's like, she's 11. She said, daddy, is that the way that you talk to a client after you do their hair when you want them to pay? And I was like, I'm, it's a game, baby. <laughs> you know, it's a game. She called. She schooled him. She, she, she called put him out. right in his place. She called me out. So, uh, so you obviously you guys have been able to see some really cool stuff. I mean, you you know you got to be around. Uh, you got to go through two Super Bowls, John. You guys got to be around those things as a family. All those things. What was the first pinch me moment for both of you? And I'm sure it was different for both of you. Like, um, you know, that oh, I can't believe I'm in this spot. I know mine. Do you know yours? I feel like all the time I pinch myself. <laughs> a lot of time I do. Like, is this really happening? You know? What was the, Jamie, what was the last one? Like that maybe you walked in and you, you know, you hung out. I remember meeting John Paul for the first time. John Paul, who, uh, a former owner of Patron and uh, Paul Mitchell owner. I remember meeting him and, and freezing, like just, oh, uh, and him saying, Hey Kelly, <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know you knew my name. And then he said, Can we sit down and have a talk? Because we haven't talked in a while. And I was thinking, We haven't talked in 33 years, because I was 33 years old at the time. And I just, flew, I was inside. I was here. When, when was the last kind of freak out moment for you? Oh my goodness. I mean, being in Nashville, there's a lot because with the whole country music industry, you know, you get to meet so many people and. Um, I'll just think about that because there are quite a few. I think I think the the first one for me where I was like, "Am I am I really here?" Uh, we were in Boston. I was with the Patriots at the time, and it was Coach Belichick's um, girlfriend Linda Holiday's uh, birthday party, and and he proceeded to go on stage and serenade her with a song. And I'm Belichick, and I'm standing beside John Bon Jovi. And I'm like, 
okay, I'm sitting here chopping it up with Bon Jovi and Belichick is singing on stage. This is not <laughs> real. Um, and then probably about three or four months ago, it was another just like, um, I'm sitting there and it was, uh, I think it was a Friday night. We kind of get out of the office a little early on Friday nights. And um, I'm sitting there, we're watching TV or something, and I get a text message, and I don't, I don't have the number, uh, the person stored in my phone. So I read it, and like it was, hey, uh, enjoyed hanging out last week at practice, pulling for you guys. Let me know if you need anything, Kenny Chesney. And I'm like, oh wow, okay, uh, Kenny's got my cell phone number. <laughs> Much love, brother. <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's, it's cool stuff like that, you know. He's put your name in his phone, so that's and you don't have his number in your phone, so I got it. I got him. I got him locked in now. We're text buddies now. <laughs> so when you got uh, Union City, how far is Union City? Where is it at in Tennessee? Because I used to live in Memphis. Um, yeah, you're about uh, if you go due north, about and about two hours from Memphis. Um, that's Union City. It's in the very northwest corner of the state. So, John, I was, uh, I, you know, I told you I grew up as an Oilers fan. And then uh, when they became the Tennessee Oilers, I was actually living in Memphis. And I moved right before I moved in December and the uh, Oilers came to Tennessee or to, to Memphis that first year. And I missed it. Um, so I never got to live in the same city. I'm trying to get my wife possibly to get a place in Nashville so we can go and, uh, you know, be at the games all the time. Um, that would be a good time. Um, how has, like, what has been, been the adjustment getting there to Nashville and, you know, getting inside the community and stuff like that? How have they received you? No, it's been, um, you know, it's, it's been, it's been really good. You know, we've been fortunate enough. We've really, um, we haven't had a bad move yet. There's some that we liked a little bit better than others. Um, but you know, this one, the, the, the community has been extremely supportive of us. Um, you know, we try to do more than just, um, be known as, as the you know Titans GM and and tight you know, we try to, we try to give back whether it's to our church or or it's to foundations that are you know that are around um, around the city or that are important to us um, juvenile di diabetes in particular with our daughter Taylor um, but there's stuff that we try to do and we try to we try to show support um, you know there's a local business right up the street from us that have really really been good to us and uh, it's a restaurant and 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 we've for the last couple of Fridays we've we've given those guys some cash and said, Hey, can you, can you make some stuff up and go take it to, to some doctors and nurses up, up the street at, uh, at one of the hospitals. So um, just trying to, to provide uh, God has really blessed us um, with, with the position that we're in uh, financially now. And it, it's our, uh, we feel like it's our charge to take those blessings and pay those forward um, to those in our community. So I, I would like to go into this because the, there's the there's the attitude, which honestly, like, I think if we could just, which we did, record your statement when you came into the Titans and you said, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have accountability. Uh, you know, everyone's going to be worth their salt. We're going to go after this thing. Um, let's talk about the practical application. So when you go in and you're, you know, I mean, you're hired on four years ago. Um, it's basically almost kind of like a stepdad in a sense, coming into a new family. Here you are. Um, what are some of the steps that somebody can take that's coming into a new company to be able to, cause you shifted the whole culture. Like the, I've watched it from the outside. Um, I think it from the inside, but I've watched it shift. What were some of those things that you, the, the practical application, like, Hey, I did this, 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 and this, uh, to be able to make that start, uh, stuff start to happen. Um, I think from, from, from an organization, non-player standpoint, the first thing I did um, I had probably been on the job less than a day, maybe two days. And I, I set, I, I went in one morning and I set my briefcase down and I looked out my windows overlook our practice field. And there's a chain link fence that there's a, there's a lake right there too. And I looked out there and there were weeds growing up all through that chain link fence. And I was like, huh? Um, so I went downstairs I didn't call the, the landscapers or our grounds crew and I put on my work clothes and I went out there and I pulled all of those weeds out of the fence and I put them in a pile and I took a picture of them. And then I went into our indoor facility, our bubble, and there were Gatorade bottles, there was tape, there was water bottles, there was old practice scripts, there was basically trash laying everywhere. 
and I picked up all that trash and I took a picture of it with my cell phone. And then I took the trash and I threw it away and I took the weeds and I threw it away. And I went back inside, showered up and I went to my computer and I uploaded those pictures. And I said, I spent the last three hours pulling weeds and picking up trash. And I've walked by the walls in our facility for the last two days. And all I see is we're gonna be a first class organization. We're gonna be a first class organization stamped on our mission statement. The actions that I see that have gone on around here do not reflect first class. Here's what I've done for the last three hours. I'm willing to roll my sleeves up and go to work for this organization, for this city, for this community, for this state. But, and, and I want everybody that's willing to work with me to, to saddle up, let's go. Because this is the way it's gonna be done or, or you can find somewhere else to work. Um, and then you transcend that to the players um, there were players that just weren't doing things right. Some big name players and, and I traded them or I cut them. Um, and then other players who were trying to do the right thing. I got word through sources in the building that would come up and say, you've got the boys talking. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And they said, they realized that you're not messing around. And I'm like, I'm not messing around. Like, this is the way it's going to be because I know this is the way that works. And I'm not trying to be mean about it. I'm not trying to be, you know, some, this tough guy about it. I know this is what wins. And when you taste that, when you taste that, um, you'll be about it too. So. So what do you like, how were you able to foresee? Because you were around when you drafted uh, Julian Edelman, you were around uh, during Gronkowski, uh, you drafted Mike Evans, who I wanted the Titans to get uh, in that draft. I was really happy that we didn't, uh, that we got uh, Mariota and not Jameis. I was very happy with that. Um, but, uh, you know, you see talent on a different level. Like Julian Edelman, was he seventh, eighth round, ninth round? Seventh round, yeah, he was a quarterback. And so how, like, how are you able to see that? Like, and what are you looking for from a distance? Because, and then the, the second question uh, part of it is both of you guys are doing things, uh, both of you as a couple are doing things that are, are long haul, right? So you're not, I mean, but you're in a, in a, in a, in a organization and in a, a profession that is the NFL, which is not for long, right? And if you don't win now, a lot of times you get gone, but you're saying, I'm willing to put in the work to be able to create this. How are you able to stay in that when you're in an environment that's saying, I need results, I need ROI, I need wins, I need playoffs, I need this. How does that happen in both, for both of you guys? Yeah, on, I mean, on, on the football side, it's, um, that's, a, that's a balance. You have to, um, there's, there's certainly a foundational piece um, about that, that you have to put in place, and that's, that's really in the draft. Um, you have – because those players are – they're younger players. Uh, their salaries aren't as high. And you have to get return on those investments. Um, and they've got to perform, form, perform for you. Jack Conklin's a perfect example. He was my first ever draft pick. I love Jack. And, and, and Jack went on to have a really, really strong career for us. And then he played himself to a level that financially we couldn't afford what Cleveland was willing to pay for him. So, you know, we have Dennis Kelly, who we traded for, and now he's going to plug in and play. And we've got another draft here in two weeks that we have to continue to build those foundational pieces. Um, if you want to know why Ohio State and, and Alabama and LSU and those guys are always at the top of the food chain, it's because they recruit really, really good players and they coach them up. It's the same thing with the draft. Uh, those foundational pieces have to come from the draft. Uh, and then you add free agent pieces and then you, you get other guys um, – through whatever avenue you they come onto your team, uh, you have the culture in place, um, and then hopefully they buy into it. So with uh, Jamie, with with yourself, uh, like you, obviously you guys come from humble beginnings. That's what we talked about, right? And Brooke and I have had this this talk before, where when we first started dating, uh, we were like, if we well, she said that she would never have kids, she would never marry <laughs> anything like that. She told me this while we're dating, um, but. <laughs> Um, we, when we were early on married, I remember saying, uh, you know, when we have kids, we are not taking them to really nice hotels. Like we stay at, we're going to have them stay at the motel six with the nanny. <laughs> and then we're going to stay at the four seasons. So they understand what life is truly like, you know what I'm saying? Now my parents and probably your parents and your parents too, John had to say no. Cause they couldn't, 
right? If you asked for something, they couldn't do it, like, and you were like, oh, I'm so mad at you, but you know what? We can't. Now with your kids, you have to say no because you want to, not because you can't. How are you able to help that? Because, you know, like you guys are a bootstraps generation. We got a generation now that's coming in that, you know, the normal part is dad hanging out with Bon Jovi watching Belichick sing. Um, you know what I mean? So how are you guys able to do that with kids as you're as they're growing up? Yeah, you know, I think it started whenever they were little. Um, and just reminding them that God has blessed us with this. And my biggest fear is the fact that they, um, for instance, let me tell you, our, we have a 14 year old, she's gonna be driving soon. Um, and she's like, the first time she said it, I nearly flipped a lid. She's like, mom, what if I get like a used Mercedes or a used BMW? I'm like, oh, no, ma'am. I'm like, we're going to Nissan used car lot. And I was like, you are not. And then I explained to her why. And I'm like, you don't. I was like, what if you get that BMW? What, how are you going to get excited for something when you're older? You know, um, and that's just we just remind them of where we came from. Whereas in another sense is you do want to give them everything because you do have this opportunity to do it. Whereas your parents didn't have the opportunity. So it's a fine line because you, you do want to do it. And we honestly, we do give them as much as they can. We actually, um, the other day they're begging for a Westie and a little puppy and, so they offered, they were like, we'll give you, we'll give you part of it. And we were like, okay, sure. And John surprised us and said, okay, we'll get one. And all three of us were freaking out, but they're giving us some of the money for it. You know? Yeah. Tough guy, tough guy really came out at me right there. Yeah, sure. You guys go ahead and get it. <laughs> hey, I did it too, John. Seven years. I said no. And I said yes. And boy, oh boy. Uh, yes, yes, I am morning. picking up poop. I am. Uh, I, we had to change the floors in the house. Um, I have lost my religion a couple times. Jesus has left me a couple of times while I'm in the street throwing the leash at the dog. Um, <laughs> I have to say that um, I am very proud of our 14 year old because she is living in the world that none of us, the four of us, have not lived in with social media and the pressures of getting the Gucci, this Gucci, you know, that kind of stuff. And John did surprise her for her birthday and let her get a belt that she wanted to get. And not very often I see her wear it. And I ask her and why, why don't you wear your belt? And she's like, I don't, I don't want to flex mom. I don't want to flex. And it just, it's when she says stuff like that, I'm like, okay, we want as parents. You know? Yes. So, John, take us through a, uh, uh, you know, seem, seem like a super discipline. I love this hard work, and you're getting in, you're pulling weeds, you're picking up Gatorade bottles, you're doing a whole nine. Take us through a, a day in John's world. What are you, what, are you up before everyone? Are you bailing hay? Do you have hay out in the backyard that you bail just to keep in touch? Uh, my, 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 I did bail hay back in the day, but um, those days are, <laughs> those days are long gone, thank God. There's no, I'm not in shape enough to bail hay now, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm an early morning guy. Usually uh, this morning I rolled over at three 30 and I was in here in my, my office at four o'clock sending an email just because I, uh, the, the mind started racing. Um, so I'm usually in the office around um, as early as four 30, no later than five 30. Usually I, I, I've got um, a Peloton in my office. So I, I get some type of cardio in to get the brain moving, get the blood flowing early on. Um, I'll sit down and make my to-do list. Uh, I'll go down and shower, grab some breakfast, come back up. According to, according to what part of the season we're in, we, if we're in, you know, if it's during our season, uh, we'll have squad meetings around 7:30, 8 o'clock. Um, and then, you know, once the squad meetings are over, I'll go up and start working, watching college guys. We may have a workout with pro guys. I'll go to practice. I'll come in. I'll watch practice. Um, we'll have meetings as a, as a personnel staff. Um, determine the injuries, meeting with the trainers, and then what you know, turn the table to watching college guys at night before. They're usually getting home around nine nine thirty that night. Wow. 
So when you're going through, like when you're doing what you're doing now, obviously we're in the draft part of it, but with the COVID-19, how are you staying in touch with players and things like that? What are some of the things that you're doing and what's the messages that you're sending out to them? Because there's, and I'm sure Jamie, you're having to go through this too, where, you know, you're, you're the first lady, right? So there's responsibilities that you have in this stuff. How are, and we have a company um, and we're wading through this. Um, how are you guys staying in touch and also, you know, keeping that, that, that strong culture um, when you're at a distance? Well, I think the one thing that I've, I've realized, I've, I've got to do um, a, a webcast for our, our, daughter's, our daughter's school next Friday. And they sent me a list of questions that they just kind of wanted to touch on. One of the, and one of the questions was, what's the one thing that you've noticed with this, you know, stay at home or, or quarantine? Uh, time in our uh, in our civilization right now, and I think it's the one thing is is how much uh, human interaction on a daily basis there is, and when that's taken away, how much that's missed. I mean, you think about all of the happy hours and all of the Zoom um, and the Facetimes and, and and all of that that's going on. Um, it's because w- we as a human race. Uh, that's what we're made of is interacting with each other socially. Um, so as it relates to the organization, uh, we have Zoom and we have Microsoft Teams uh, that we get on in groups and we talk about players and prospects in virtual meetings. Uh, Coach Vrabel and myself, we've been FaceTiming um, the prospects for the last three or four days where we'll jump on a call and the kid will be on a call and we'll, he's got a grease board behind him and he'll draw up plays and ask him questions and uh, I have their their reports from our scouts up in front of me on the computer, and I'm asking questions about you know that our scouts have have kind of posed for them, um, and that's kind of the world that that we're having to to kind of navigate now. Um, I typically like to look another look at you know these young men in their eyes and see if 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 I want to work with them on a daily basis, and that's what I've told all these guys is um, what we're trying to do in these interactions is you're going to come into the building at six o'clock in the morning and you're going to leave at five o'clock during the season. And you're going to spend a lot of time with us. And, and I have to know if, if we're going to be able to work together for one common goal, that's all it is. You can be as good a player or you need to work on this, that, and the other, but are we going to be able to work together? Are you, are you going to allow yourself to buy into what we've got going on so that you can improve as a football player and then so, if so, then you will help us as a football team. Um, and it's been good. It hasn't been perfect, um, but we've been able to kind of navigate the situation as best as possible. So, John, when you're looking at it, too, what, are, what would be the top three things that you're looking at that are the not, not normal or not uh, obvious things when you are going to draft or you're looking at a, a, a free agent? Because a lot of us from the, from the, the couch, right, we're like, yo, the Titans should have so-and-so and you're looking and saying, okay, I, that box wasn't checked. That box wasn't checked. That box wasn't checked. So I want you to answer that part. But then Jamie, I want you to come in with, have you ever been, Jamie, have you ever spotted something and been like, yo, John, like you need to, you see this? Cause this happens to me. Like I have blind spots. Um, so a lot of them, a lot of them, except for the Titans. Uh, I have a lot of blind spots, but John, what, what are those top three things that, that most people aren't like the nuances that, people aren't looking for that you're saying, I see that. I see that. I see that. I'm out. Yeah. I think it's uh, the first, the first, um, are, are they, are they, do they have a team first attitude? Um, are they in it? What's, are they in the, are they in the sport of football to win as a football team or do they just want to go to the pro bowl or be an all pro and they could really care less if they win or not. Um, so are they willing to put the team first? Um, are there, are they, are they accountable? Um, we have a we have a we have a statement on one of our walls that says, "Are you able?" And it says, "Are you accountable? Are you dependable? Um, are you are you available? Um, are you coachable? Are you dependable?" So it's all they all end with able, um, but it's it's players that are dependable, that are coachable. Um, you know, they may be a great player, but we have you know a pretty good idea that they're not going to be coachable. Um, so it's going to be hard to work with that player. So team first attitude: Are they able? Uh, meaning do they embody all those things and, and are they smart enough to handle our system? Jamie, what's some of the blind spots that you've been able to see? And like I said, I mean, I believe that, you know, John, you and I, men of the house, we got this right. We're the head, yeah. we're the head. 
but then there's the neck and the neck turns the head wherever they well, wants to go, right? So what are, what, what are some of those blind spots? And maybe even give us an example, Jamie, of a blind spot that you were like, nope. <laughs> I will tell you, I wish my 14 year, year old was here to answer, answer this question because she's the one <laughs> neck for this. She'll, I have to ask her questions. I'm like, Taylor, whose number is so-and-so? You know, I just, with me, I show up on Sundays, I root on our team, but it's our little one that is so just, that's, she is the girliest girl that you would ever meet. But at the same time, Amy always says, I'm going to hire her one day. <laughs> yeah, she's, and our and our eleven year old is starting to. This is the year that our fourteen year old started getting into it as well. And so our eleven year old is she's coming up right behind her, doing the same thing. I didn't know anything about football when we first started dating at all. Wow. Yeah. So so both of you, uh, John. What is your favorite football uh, movie of all time? Um, probably Rudy. As Ooh. cheesy as that may sound, because. I mean, there was a guy that that you know went to, he 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 was just so passionate about uh, Notre Dame football and everybody told him he was too small and he wasn't good enough and that he'd never play and he just kept fighting and fighting. It's kind of the the way that I'm made up. I mean, because um, growing up in my little town, I can remember in in at a baseball camp when I was in seventh grade going to eighth grade, we all sat around as as seventh grade boys and. What are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to do when you grow up? Um, and I was just the factory worker's son who we also had a little farm. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to be in the NFL one day. And they, all the other little boys laughed and they said, oh, yeah, whatever. You're not getting out of here. You're going to be at the factory where your dad is. And, and I kind of was like, okay, we'll see. And um, so I'd say Rudy because he kind of had that never quit attitude. And he showed him, you know, at the end of the day, he was going to, he was going to play for the Irish. Nice. So now, I, obviously, I want to be able to respect you guys' time. Um, I want to stay on all day, and I'll, well, I'll just be on uh, Zoom with you all day, John. You can just leave me in the background. And when they ask, like, who's the caveman in the room, you could be like, he's the special assistant. Uh, special now. assignment. Special yeah. assignment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, little, little John... Obviously, you had that aspiration, right? You had that kind of Star Wars. Hey, this is where I want to go. This is what I want to do. I want to. I want to go to these heights. Um, now you're in that spot. What's your Star Wars or galaxy far, far away now? Um, I mean, I think it's. I think it's once you once you once you get here, um, it's it's first off. Um, try to try to be a good husband and a good dad um, on a daily basis um, never let them down um, once you get the once you get the chair uh, you try to keep the chair uh, meaning once you get once you get in that spot you want to try to stay in that spot um, and I don't want to stay in that spot and just kind of be middle of the road I think you know we we we've we haven't had a losing season yet we've been to the playoffs twice uh, we were one game away from the Super Bowl, and and I think that um, that that's our goal. Our goal is to win the division. Um, it's it's to host a home playoff game or a couple, um, and then it's ultimately to try to get to the to the big game. Um, I've been there as a scout. Coach Vrabel's been there as a player, um, and and I think there would be nothing cooler uh, from a career professional enjoyment. Um, because obviously marrying Jamie and the birth of our two daughters, those three days um, will probably, not probably, uh, those will always be at the top. Um, but to be able to bring that trophy home and have a big parade down on Broadway and hold that bad boy up, uh, <laughs> that'd be pretty, pretty cool. Well, I was asking Jamie because I know we're like obviously you've been busy and uh, you know we've been well, I've been wanting to get you scheduled and stuff and she's like uh, we've been busy and I said I know he's planning the Super Bowl parade uh, I completely understand <laughs> um, so so take us to last season right because last season two and four now every and this is what all my buddies hate me on our group text because I've been with my buddies since fourth grade on all our group texts. 
every week I send out like when we were we went uh, what well, we went two and two and then dropped four or went it was right two and zero oh and then dropped four. Um, yeah, but one, yeah, we we beat Cleveland, yes. came home, lost to Indy, one and one. Uh, went to one and two, and then we got to two and two, and then we lost two. Yes. So when we got to every week, when we were one and one, I was like, okay, I send a text out saying, okay, cool. The Titans are going to be 15 and one, uh, run through the playoffs and have a Super Bowl victory. How's that sound guys? And then the next week when we were two and four, I was like, oh, well guys, uh, you know, a, a four or a 12 and four season is going to be okay. And I do this the whole year and they hate me. They turn off the uh, text. They, they hear this at two and four, take us into your mind at that point, because at this point, People are at two and four. A lot of people were saying ESPN, especially all oh, the seasons over all these things. What are you saying to the team and to the players? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I met with, with coach Vrabel and he had, he had already had a message um, in, in mind for the team after that, that loss in Denver. Um, and it was that the only, the only people uh, that can change the course or the trajectory trajectory of our, of our season um, is the men in this room. And, and we've got to hold each other accountable. Every single one of us, uh, we believe in each other. Um, and, and it starts today. Like we're, 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 we're flushing uh, the first third of the season and we're starting anew this week. And um, the, the guys started working harder. We talked about having to work harder at practice. You, you think you've been working hard, you got to do a little bit more. He preached effort and finish, effort and finish on offense, defensive, and, and in the kicking game, um, playing longer than the other guys. And I think it, what you know, I alluded to it earlier that the, that the end of the season, Tennessee Titans, we we just wanted it more than everybody else. Um, it was so cool to watch our guys play, um, the the way that they were finishing blocks, the way that they were running at the end of the play way they were flying around to the football and hitting people. Um, we just wanted it more than, than the other teams. Um, and we just didn't have quite enough dudes in that Kansas City game um, to kind of get, to get over it, to stop, uh, to stop Mahomes and the boys. That was, that was a tough one. But I, I do it like this. Are you familiar with NFL math? No. Okay, so I want to school you on this because he, I think it's something. He made it up himself. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I – my buddies and I are on the text and I do NFL math, which means that uh, when the, when the, you remember when the Eagles beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl, right? Well, the next season, then the Titans beat the, the Eagles, which made us Super Bowl champions. And so this is NFL math. So last year, um, because we beat the Chiefs in the regular season and they're the champions now, we are the champions. We beat the Patriots and Tom Brady and Tom Brady is unequivocally the greatest uh, quarterback to ever play the game. That means that Ryan Tannehill is the best quarterback to ever play the game. And the Tennessee Titans are the greatest organization of all time, according to NFL math. Uh, would you concur on this, John? That sounds like my 11 year olds common core or whatever, where they <laughs> just kind of estimate stuff sometimes, which I have a hard problem with, but Okay. <laughs> I thought you were with me, John. I thought yeah, you were. He, I'm kind of with you, but it's... made it up so it like it makes him well, feel better. And every one of my friends they hate it. I'm like, anyone want to dis discuss NFL math? And they're like, no. no, and they just shut it down completely. <laughs> but everything honestly comes back to the Titans being the greatest team of all time. Yeah, uh, is what is what it is. Um, so in the in the playoffs uh, and uh, towards the towards the end, you start to see Derrick Henry go now, uh, like. Have you ever seen anything like that? No, it was real. I mean, it was, it, it was um, certainly his, his individual performance. Um, but the way the guys were, were blocking for him and, and, and opening up holes for him. And I mean, you see receivers, Corey Davis and, and AJ, they're running in there and, and hitting safeties and linebackers and trying to knock them out of the way just so we could kind of get him downhill. Cause we knew if we could get him downhill, he, he was just, he was hard to stop. Um, so you saw linemen throwing their bodies um, and making blocks that, that they didn't make to your point in those first six games. Um, but at the end there, they were just throwing themselves around uh, for each other and all 11 guys 
um, working hard to get him going and get him some space so he could roll. So Jamie, take us there emotionally when you guys are in Foxborough, and I love this story, you're in Foxborough, and I, I wanna uh, lead up to this, I need to put a smoke machine on for the whole nine, and the Tennessee Titans retired Tom Brady from the Patriots, and your husband is the head of this. Take us through the emotion, are you losing it at this time? So it was, it was a surreal moment, actually, because we lived there for five years at one point. And so we, I, it was a reunion of all sorts for me and the girls. Um, I personally was not going to go to the game. I have never been to Gillette Stadium before as a non-fan. So the last time we went to the playoffs and, um, Played them. I didn't go. I just couldn't. Deep down, I was like, nobody truly understands what it's like to be this invested and not just a fan. And so um, my best friend called me and she was like, are you kidding? And I'm like, no, I'm not coming. And she was like, she begged and begged and begged. So anyway, I called her the next day. And I'm like, okay, I, th I think we'll do it. So the girls and I went, stayed with her and her husband, who her husband is a Foxborough policeman in charge of all the security of Gillette Stadium. And I mean, it was surreal walking through that stadium with another team's logo on my body. And so getting there, Honestly, at this point, you're thinking how amazing that we got to the playoffs considering where we started for the season. And then you get there amongst the fans and I had a sense of pride and it was, I've been in the Saints stadium as a different fan because I grew up a Saints fan and it was the same thing sitting in there as a Bucks, um, Bucks wife. I just had such a sense of pride of those fans and that's the way I felt about the Patriots and then all of a sudden it just, it exploded all around us. And I was, it was just so shocking. I cried. I mean, there's videos of me crying and I, it was, it was a very, that probably could be my pinch me moment. <laughs> right on. Well, John, what are you, what are you going through emotionally at that time? Like, I mean, this is tough because obviously coach Belichick is a huge mentor. Am I correct? I mean, you, you, right, yeah. You, you see that those parts, uh, what were you going through at the time? Um, I was pretty fired up because we got to play another week. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I had logged a lot of hours in that stadium because our offices were, were, were a part of Gillette. Um, um, so I knew all of the, the ins and outs of, of the building and had, had ran a lot of um, a lot of sprints on the, on the game field after practice or something when I was coming back into the locker room. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of really, really cool memories about that place and um, thankful for Mr. Kraft and Coach Belichick for giving me my start in the NFL there. But um, yeah, to go in there and, 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 and beat those guys um, and continue our season, it was really, really cool. And the, probably the, one of the things that made me really proud was a lot of the scouting staff is still um, on there in New England and they were in the press box kind of down from me a little bit. And, Every one of them came down to me and shook my hand and said, if anybody could have beat us, I'm glad it's you, J-Rob. So uh, it, was, it was fun. So what, like when you, uh, you know, you, you guys as a couple, uh, you guys as a family inspire so many people, you know. I mean, obviously I'm, I, I get so excited about the Titans and things like that. But uh, the reason why I wanted to have you guys here is because of who you guys are as people. And the fact that you guys would take the time with us and we appreciate it. Um, what's the message that you want to send out um, about, from the Robinson family, not the general manager of the Titans, um, but from, the, from, from you, from John and Jamie, um, that, you know, I, I find that the, the one thing that people have in common that succeed to high levels is, is their attitude. And they seem to have, they seem to play on a different playing field in their mind. And it seems to be like getting to spend time with you guys, that seems to be the common thing here is you guys have a different type of attitude uh, towards things and you look at things in a different way. And, and um, so what's that message that both of you guys want to send out that says like, you know, this is what, this is the legacy we want to leave. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's really, it's, it's three things. It's, um, it's, it's one f finding something that you're passionate about um, and going after it 100%. 
Um, for me, for me, it's football and it's my family. Uh, for Jamie, it's, I think, to speak on her behalf, it's supporting our family, whether it's uh, foundational pieces um, for raising money for, for JDRF or, 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 or making sure our youngest Bailey gets to all her sporting events. And she's, um, she attacks um, those things 100% with passion, uh, just like I do football. Um, so that's probably one. Uh, two, it's, it's treating other people the way you want to be treated, um, respect, um, honor those. Um, and, and then three is never asking anybody to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. Um, I, I'm not going to ask somebody uh, to go uh, pick up this or you need to do this or you need to do that if I'm not willing to go pick up a paint roller and paint a wall myself. Um, so having those three things, passion in what you do, treating people the way you want to be treated, um, and never asking anybody to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. Uh, I think those are three, we think those are three pretty mm -hmm. cool things to live by. And I think you always have to remember too, it's, um, there's a reason why we're in a place where we're at and you can't, you can't forget about that, you know, and it's, we, we just want to help as much as we can with anybody. We, we actually adopt families or a family every Christmas. And that's one thing that I think helps with keeping our kids, you know, stay humble is that's their most favorite thing to do for Christmas. You can ask them and it's going out shopping, coming home wrapping. And then we are blessed that we get to de actually deliver to this family and um, many things like, like that. That's, I don't know. It just, you have to remember where you come from. Well, I want to thank you guys. Um, if you have a, a, a second, I'd like to tell you a story. And this, this is the story of this thing right back there. Um, but there was a, a Christmas uh, when I was in 10th grade and all I wanted was an Oilers jacket. I had been an Oilers fan for my whole life and all I wanted was the Oilers parka, but there wasn't an internet. And so you couldn't order it online. And I lived in California and my dad made $1,100 before uh, taxes. Um, and we only had one income and we only had one car. So you just have to drive 40 miles each way. And we lived in a double wide mobile home on the side of the freeway. And all I wanted was this jacket. And I was very unappreciative because I didn't realize the magnitude of how much that jacket would cost and how little my parents had. Well, we got to Christmas time and uh, it was the first time we ever got to videotape because my dad had a videotape because he was a caretaker at a school. So they're videotaping the whole Christmas. Well, every present that I open, I'm madder and madder because it's not the jacket. And I was thinking in my head when I, woke, when I woke up, if I don't get the jacket, I don't care about anything else. And I kept opening and I kept opening and I kept getting madder and madder and they're videotaping me the whole time. And I ruined Christmas with my attitude the whole time. And I got down to the last box. And John, the, uh, Jamie, the box is about this big. And I thought there is no way that my mom could fit a parka into that box. So I remember, and I just, and it's on video, and I just tore it open, I threw it to the side, looked at it, just threw it to the side, and I was all mad, and I ruined Christmas, and Christmas was over, it was done. And my parents didn't say anything to me, they were just, we were just all hanging out, and I was like, man, this was the worst Christmas ever, because my parents didn't give me what I wanted. And um, I went to the bathroom about an hour later, I came back out, and there was a big box in the middle of the floor. And the big box, you can imagine what was in it. It was that Oilers parka. And when I opened it, I knew what it was when it was going and I lifted it out and I saw it, but I didn't enjoy it as much as I would have because I was so horrible on the way leading to it. Well, my mom passed away June 19th, 2018, so about a year and a half ago. And at her service, um, she spoke to me and told me about the jacket. And what she told me was that God has a plan for every one of us. He has a purpose for every single one of us. And that purpose is already written and done. But he's just waiting to see how we react during the process. And I failed because I was so mad. But if I would have known that I was getting the jacket, I would have had a great attitude the whole time. So for all of our listeners out there, I want you to know that your story is already written. With John and Jamie, their story was already written. The, uh, all the great things that are going to happen in their life are already done. And if we walk with an attitude like we already accept it, we will live a better life. We will live on a different level and accept the things that God already has planned for you. So thank you guys so much for being on the podcast. We love you. You're awesome. And um, 
I want to tell you this too. I tell this, uh, I'll tell you this. I told Jamie this. I'm going to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life. So um, get ready for it because now you can't get rid of me. We're friends. Y'all are coming to a game and bring Pops. <laughs> Pops is the man. Thank, Thank you. Thank you guys. Tighten up.